June 4th, 2008, Jody Arias killed her boyfriend and then donned an innocent mask, claiming it was in self-defense. However, her facade eventually crumbled and she earned the title of the most hated woman in America. These are 13 female convicts reacting to life sentences. Number 13. Diana Lovejoy September 1st, 2016, Jason Kovach made a frantic call to 911, reporting that his friend Greg Mulvill had been shot. It was past 11 p.m. and the two friends had gone to the secluded trail near Avenida Soledad in Carlsbad, California. They didn't know was this man was lurking behind the bushes, waiting for the perfect moment to shoot Greg. Naturally, the police wanted to know why they were there at that time of night and who wanted to hurt Greg. It didn't take them much to uncover the truth. Greg was in the middle of a bitter divorce and custody battle with his estranged wife, Diana Lovejoy. 2014, when the couple split, Lovejoy made a serious accusation against her husband, claiming that he had sexually abused her and maybe even their son. However, after a thorough investigation, no evidence was found to support those allegations. The police also discovered that throughout their separation, Diana started firearms training at the Oceanside Gun Range, where she met a man called Weldon McDavid, who later installed a security system in her home. And though McDavid was married, it was reported they were intimate a few times. And any time the court didn't grant something in her favor, McDavid became furious on her behalf. That led police to believe that if Greg was targeted and shot, McDavid may be able to provide some answers. Moreover, the investigation confirmed their initial suspicions. McDavid and Diana were the masterminds behind the scheme that resulted in Greg being shot. They were arrested and had a joint trial, where they both pleaded not guilty. It was revealed that McDavid, using a burner phone he told Lovejoy to buy, pretended to be a private investigator and made a call to Greg shortly before 11 p.m. He told Greg that he may have evidence proving Greg's abusive behavior, which could be used against him in the divorce proceedings. He also told him that he would leave that evidence on a pole along a dirt path of Avenida Soledad. Of course, there was no such evidence. It was a trick. McDavid testified that the idea behind the ploy was that if such a sketchy phone call could lure Greg to a dark spot late at night, it showed that he must be guilty of something and Lovejoy could use it against him in the custody battle. Greg showed up with his friend. They had a small baseball bat and a bike light as they headed down this dirt road and reached the pole. Greg began to shine the light around the area. Subsequently, Greg spotted McDavid dressed in camo lying on his stomach in the bushes, pointing a long barrel gun at him. That's when the shot was fired. The prosecutor argued that the expert gunman pulled the trigger as a hired hitman and that he was convinced to do so by Lovejoy, whom he described as manipulative, narcissistic, and completely self-absorbed. McDavid testified that he was just trying to shoot out the light in Greg's left hand, fearing that he had a gun. He also testified that if he intended to kill Greg, he could have easily done so. But nobody believed him. The jury found him both guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and premeditated attempted murder. As soon as the verdict was read out loud in court, Lovejoy collapsed, being taken out of the court on a stretcher and brought to the hospital. Guilty of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder. She was later sentenced to 26 years to life in prison, while McDavid got 50 years to life. Looks like Lovejoy wasn't the only woman on this list fainting upon hearing her sentence. It goes to show you that if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Number 12. Shelby Isaac January 22nd, 2016. Shelby shot and killed Eddie E.J. Tate Jr. and his pregnant girlfriend Edwina Thomas. And what was the reason behind this senseless act? Believe it or not, it was all over hair weaves. Isaac was arrested that same day. An investigator said that her motive for this killing was that she previously had bought hair weaves from the couple and wanted her money back. Eddie and Edwina were running a business selling hair extensions. On the day of the murders, Shelby paid $250 for three hair weaves, which she would bought from Tate in a parking lot. Apparently upset with the purchase, Isaac set up a second meeting with Tate and Thomas so she could get a refund. 
During her trial, the prosecutor, Gavin Smith, said she knew exactly what she was doing when she brought a gun to that meeting and opened fire on the couple. We know that she took the time to pull out that gun. She took the time to extend her arm and point it at these people, Smith said. During the trial, the prosecutor showed the jury fingerprint evidence linking Isaac to the crime scene. Witnesses also said she had blood on her clothes, and the police found a lot of cash in her possession shortly after the couple was killed. The state's main witness, Victoria Shea, was the only one driving the getaway car. Victoria made conflicting statements, claiming at times that she saw Isaac pull the trigger, but previously stating that she didn't see the gun. The defense attorneys reminded the jurors that Victoria had admitted to lying under oath. Witnesses reported seeing Victoria's car at the scene, but not Isaac's. During the closing arguments, the defense argued that Victoria was the actual killer and that she lied about Isaac's involvement to divert attention from herself. Shea was actually the first person arrested in the case. She was arrested with blood on her bootleg and on the driver's side of her car, which was the getaway car. The defense pointed out that there was no blood on the passenger seat where Isaac would have sat if Shea's version of events was true. Despite the defense's arguments, the jury found Shelby Isaac guilty on two counts of second-degree murder. When the judge began reading the verdict, Isaac lowered her head. As the judge continued on reading with the other counts, Isaac fainted and remained on the ground for at least five minutes while deputies attempted to revive her. She was later sentenced to 30 years. Number 11. Kyandria Cook June 27, 2017, 18-year-old Kyandria Cook was given 20 years in state prison for using a dating app to set up a robbery that ultimately led to the shooting of another individual. Now, the judge acknowledged that Kyandria wasn't the one to pull the trigger and that the victim luckily survived but noted that she was still responsible for her actions. And as he began reading her sentence, Kyandria's mom dropped to the floor, howling and wailing in grief so much that the judge had to repeat the sentences for the clerk to record them. And for that, I'm going to go ahead and adjudicate you guilty of all three charges, sentence you to 20 years in state prison. <laughs> now, Kyandria had used a dating app to lure the victim, Emmanuel Purcell, to South Daytona, Florida. Once he arrived, her and her boyfriend, Kendrick Bass, attempted to steal his car before Bass shot Purcell, leaving him seriously injured. They then successfully carjacked a second victim. The judge commented, That's the one thing I couldn't get over, really. That knowing how dangerous and deadly it could be, you'd be basically the same thing again. The video of Cook and her mom went viral. After her mom's meltdown, Kyandria could be seen crying and begging to hold her mom one last time before being jailed, only for the guards to take her into immediate custody. Signed by the full person of the jury. Uh, However, this video ended up garnering a lot of sympathy, leading Cook to be given a chance for a legal reevaluation. April 2018, she was ultimately convicted only for carjacking and received a reduced sentence of 11 years. Well, Kyandria may not have pulled the trigger, but this next woman on the list definitely did. And the victim happened to be none other than her own grandson. Number 10. Sandra Lane Oh, did you get shot? Who shot you? My grandma and grandma shot me. Your grandma and grandpa shot you? My grandma. I'm gonna die. Help. May 18th, 2012. Police would arrive following a 911 call only to be met with a chilling scene. With hands raised in surrender, Sandra Lane stepped out of her condo, announcing to law enforcement, I murdered my grandson. The small, frail 74-year-old woman with fading red hair led the police into her condo where Jonathan Hoffman, her grandson, lay dead. Now, the evidence recovered from the scene showed that Lane, a former school teacher, pulled the trigger 10 times, with six of them landing on Hoffman's body. During her trial, Lane told the jury that she felt overwhelmed by Hoffman's troubles, including his drug use. The attorney said that the fight broke out after Hoffman tested positive for synthetic marijuana at a court-ordered probation meeting earlier that day. 
Lane claimed that he feared flunking probation and demanded money and a car to leave the area. In addition to that, her defense attorneys argued that Lane acted in self-defense, saying Hoffman had been using drugs and their relationship was rocky. However, prosecutors said there were no signs of Lane being injured by Hoffman. A recording of the 911 call conveys him being shot again while pleading for help. Not only that, but Hoffman was wearing shorts and socks that night when he was killed and had made plans to see a friend that night, not flee. Hello? Are you there? Hoffman's father, Michael Hoffman, said in this letter read out in court that Lane put on her war paint and came in gunning for my boy. Lane's daughter, Jennifer Hoffman, told the judge, Do not show mercy. She showed no mercy when she planned, stalked, and murdered my son in his bedroom. Sandra Lane is pure evil, and if given the opportunity, would surely kill again. Lane, sobbing in her orange jumpsuit, told the court, I don't want to die in jail. March 19, 2013. Despite her pleas, the jury held their ground, finding her guilty of second-degree murder. She was handed a sentence of 20 to 40 years. Sadly, Lane's not the only woman on this list who initially appeared to be this sweet, innocent grandma, only to unveil her monstrous nature. Number 9. Vonda Star Smith August 12, 2016, the lifeless body of Jessica Nicole Morrison was discovered on the side of the road in Greenville, Tennessee. An autopsy would reveal that Jessica died from blunt force trauma and was pregnant at the time of her death. As the investigation unfolded, all fingers pointed toward one primary suspect, Vonda Star Smith, the grandmother of one of Jessica's two children. Now, the motive behind this heartbreaking murder wasn't exactly clear. But according to prosecutors, Smith was obsessed with her grandson and wanted to stay in close contact with him. They didn't specify whether Morrison denied her access to the child. Nonetheless, it's believed that a confrontation occurred between the two women on the day of the murder, resulting in Smith injuring and ultimately killing Morrison. And considering that Jessica was pregnant at the time, there was no way she could fight her way out of such a violent attack. May 2018, Vonda walked in here with a smile on her face, even exchanging a warm hug with her attorney before her sentencing at the Greene County Criminal Court. However, as the judge began to announce his verdict, her expression underwent a sudden and dramatic change. She fought to hold back the tears streaming down her face. Now, when sentencing Smith, who had tears running down her face during witness testimony. The judge said that Smith violated Morrison's trust he said she got into Smith's car not long before the murder. She trusted being with you as opposed to being with a stranger. Uh, and bad things happen. This murder happened after that. Smith was eventually sentenced to life in prison for first degree murder. And the judge also gave her a max sentence for second degree murder in relation to the unborn child. After the sentencing, Tammy Morrison, Jessica's mom, took the stand saying, There's not enough justice on this earth that can bring my daughter back or my grandchild. My biggest consolation is that she'll never see her grandchild again. Number 8. Erica May Butts and Shanita Latrice Cunningham November 3, 2011, Erica and Shanita faced a sentence hearing following their conviction for a truly heinous crime. The judge handed down a life sentence, and their response was nothing less than dramatic. These lovers from South Carolina were overcome with emotion as they collapsed, wailed uncontrollably, and struggled to catch their breath upon hearing that sentence. Court officials had to intervene, helping them off the floor and placing them in chairs as they were escorted out of the room. Witnessing such a dramatic reaction might lead some to argue for leniency. However, once you become aware of what they actually did, any sympathy will quickly fade away. These two women callously beat little Serenity Richardson while she was in their care. The explanation they gave for the beatings was that Serenity had a potty accident, claiming 
but we didn't know what we did would kill her. Now, that's hard to believe because by the time paramedics reached Serenity, she was already dead and had been placed on ice and exposed to bleach in desperate attempts to revive her. After being apprehended, Butts confessed to Somerville police that she had whipped Serenity with a belt as punishment for urinating on the floor. Surprisingly, even after admitting this, she decided to enter an Alfred plea, meaning she maintained her innocence, but recognized that going to trial would probably lead to a conviction. She said, I was responsible for some things, but I would never kill her. Cunningham, on the other hand, chose to plead guilty. During the trial, the two women ended up turning against one another. Cunningham's attorney said that her client was less culpable than Erica in Serenity's death. While Erica's attorney portrayed Shanita as the controlling and aggressive partner in this abusive relationship, describing Butts as a meek woman. However, Circuit Court Judge Deandra Richardson saw both women as equally responsible. She expressed that nothing had ever affected her as strongly as the photos of the girl's battered body. In her own words, she stated, To ignore what must have been excruciating sounds of you and that child is more than disconcerting. So without hesitation, she proceeded to sentence Butts and Cunningham to life in prison. And if you can't comprehend the cruelty of that crime, just wait until you learn about those women who committed the same heinous act, but against their own children. Number 7. Elizabeth Escalona September 7, 2011. Elizabeth glued her daughter's hands to a wall and beat her so badly that she fell into a coma. After being arrested, police said Escalona lost her temper with her daughter, Jocelyn Cedillo, over potty training problems. Escalona beat and kicked Jocelyn before sticking her hands to an apartment wall using super glue. The girl was rushed to a hospital after Escalona called her mother and said there was something wrong with her daughter. When her grandmother got to the house, she was already unresponsive. After she was brought to the Children's Medical Center in Dallas, doctors found bruises, cuts, and bite marks all over her body. She was hospitalized for days and was in a coma for two days after the incident. During her trial, Escalona said she didn't clearly remember the beating she gave to her daughter. She couldn't recall where she got the glue and had no idea why she glued her child's hands to the wall. However, right after that incident, Escalona went to her Facebook profile and changed it to one of her and Jocelyn writing, Why does God put obstacles in my life? Can you believe the audacity? Thankfully, Jocelyn has recovered from her injuries. She and her siblings were taken into state custody after her mother's arrest and now live with their grandmother. As for Escalona, she pled guilty and testified extensively in her own defense and appealed to the judge for leniency, requesting a second chance for redemption instead of imprisonment. The judge, however, had a different viewpoint. You savagely beat your child to the edge of death. For this, you must be punished. In the end, Escalona was sentenced to 99 years in prison with a chance of parole after 30. Sentence at confinement in the penitentiary for a period of 99 years. The sentence goes into effect today. And as soon as she heard that sentence, she couldn't hold back her tears. I'm pretty sure when Jocelyn was crying, she didn't stop. So it's safe to say she got what she deserved. Number six. Tatiana Fasari. 2018, Seth Welch and Tatiana Fasari came to the spotlight when they were accused of killing their daughter, Mary Welch. Both of them were convicted of first-degree murder after their daughter's death was attributed to neglect. Mary Welch weighed only eight pounds at the time of her death. After the autopsy, the doctor stated that Mary was suffering from chronic malnutrition, believing this to be caused by withholding food and water. While the parents were aware that their daughter was underweight, they refused to seek medical assistance. Instead, the couple cited religious reasons and a lack of trust in the medical system. At the time of Mary's death, two of the couple's three children had never even been to a licensed doctor. The county sheriff in Kent, Michigan also testified that the family home was unhygienic during the initial investigation. He cited evidence of vermin, insects, and mold. 
The couple was initially charged with homicide felony murder. The video of their reaction to the charges subsequently went viral as it showed their sheer disbelief. That is a charge called homicide felony murder. It is light without parole. It requires a DNA sample to be taken upon arrest. Fasari later testified that her husband was abusive and would sexually abuse and beat her. She stated that she wasn't permitted to take her daughter to a doctor and blamed the abuse for not being able to provide care for Mary. Yet Fasari still claimed that she didn't notice Mary was unhealthy and didn't know what caused her death. 2020, Seth Welch was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A year later, Fasari was also sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder. She was additionally sentenced to 15 to 30 years on the charge of first-degree child abuse. Number 5. Michelle Blair March 24, 2015 What was supposed to be a routine eviction turned into this shocking discovery sending shockwaves through the city of Detroit. Michelle Blair, a woman struggling to make ends meet, was living with her four children when she was evicted for failing to pay rent. According to relatives, she had a hard time holding down a job, often asking them for money. However, when they refused to help and instead advised her on how to find employment and maybe go back to school, the calls for money stopped. Blair chose to ignore their advice, and as a result, an eviction notice was served against her. When the crew from the district court arrived at her apartment, they found it empty. They began removing furniture, but what they stumbled upon next was beyond their worst nightmares. Hidden inside a white deep freezer in the living room was the frozen body of a girl wrapped in a large plastic bag. The police were immediately called to the scene, and their investigation led to an even more horrifying discovery. The body of a boy was found right beneath the girl. A concerned neighbor wasted no time in revealing Michelle Blair's whereabouts. The police located her at another neighbor's house, along with her two remaining children. However, her other two children and Stephen Gage Barry and Stoney Ann Blair were missing, but soon the police found out that the bodies in the apartment belonged to them. The cause of death for both Stephen and Stoney was determined to be multiple blunt force trauma. It was revealed that Stephen had been killed in August 2012, while Stoney had met the same fate in May 2013. This woman lived in her apartment for a long time with her children's bodies in the freezer. Now, what's even more shocking is that Stephen and Stoney were missing for nearly three years and no one bothered to search for them. They had fathers who were absent from their lives, and Blair had previously withdrawn them from school, claiming she would homeschool them. And whenever neighbors inquired about the kids' whereabouts, she always had some excuse ready. Now, during her trial, Blair confessed to the murders. She explained to the judge that she had killed her demons after discovering they were sexually assaulting her youngest son, although this allegation has never been proven. Blair showed no remorse for her actions and insisted that she had no other choice. In fact, during an interview, she even stated, No. And you feel no remorse for that? I would kill him again. July 2015, Michelle Blair was sentenced to life in prison without parole. You're therefore sentenced to the Michigan Department of Corrections for the rest of your life without the possibility of parole, meaning, of course, that you will never get out. Her nonchalant expression reveals a glimpse of someone completely lacking remorse. Number 4. Shayna Hubers October 12th, 2012. Shayna had shot her boyfriend, Ryan Poston, not once, but six times. Despite her claims of self-defense, two juries later found her guilty of murder. March 2011, it all started with a simple friend request on Facebook from a handsome stranger named Ryan Poston. Intrigued by a photo she had posted, Ryan quickly became Shayna's boyfriend. But 18 months down the road, their story would take a dark and tragic twist. According to Ryan's friends, Shayna became increasingly obsessed with him. And even when Ryan wanted to break up, Shayna kept bombarding him with countless text messages and would show up uninvited to his condo. However, there are conflicting accounts of their relationship. 
Some paint Ryan as this abusive, controlling boyfriend, often making hurtful comments about Shayna's weight and appearance. But everyone agrees on the basic facts of what happened on that day of the murder. Shayna Huber shot Ryan Poston six times in his apartment in Kentucky. After the shooting, Shayna's behavior was very odd. Firstly, she would wait 10 to 15 minutes before calling 911, claiming it was an act of self-defense. And once the police brought her in for questioning, she couldn't stop talking. As she rambled, she told police a different story than she told the 911 operator, claiming that first she wrestled the gun away from Poston and that she shot him six times to ensure that he was dead because she couldn't stand seeing him hurting. In 2015, Shayna Hubers went on trial. A jury quickly found her guilty, and a judge gave her 40 years in prison. After the sentencing, she commented, Looking back on it, I feel like I was led on. I feel like I was manipulated, used, and abused. But the story of Miss Hubers didn't quite end here. The next year, she did file for a retrial after it came out that one of the original jurors was a convicted felon. 2018, she went to court again, her second trial came to the same conclusion as her first. They found that she was guilty of the murder of Ryan Poston, and this time sentenced her to life in prison. Number 3. Kamia Gamut May 18th, 2012. Asleep on an inflated air mattress, Kamia woke up to the sound of glass shattering over her head. It was pitch black and she felt someone hitting her repeatedly in the back of the head and she defended herself without identifying her attacker. Gamut fell to her knees and was trying to get to her purse, which contained her phone. However, she stumbled on a knife she had used earlier to cut holes in curtains, and she would take that knife to the assailant's chest. After that, she would drop the weapon and go to the bathroom, seeking light. She cracked open the door, and that's when she saw her boyfriend, Marcel Hill, and realized who had attacked her. Without checking to see if he remained alive, she yelled his name and when he failed to respond, she immediately called 911. But this was all according to Gammon. After apprehending her, the police quickly realized that her story had holes in it. If she was so scared, why didn't she immediately run from the apartment? And how couldn't she identify her boyfriend's voice? She admitted that he called her a name and threatened to kill her. Plus. Gamut couldn't explain why Hill had 11 stab wounds when she only recalls hitting him three times, or how a bloody bent frying pan came to be in the room with the bed. Not only this, but previous legal history also displayed a motive as to why Gamut would have been the one to attack her boyfriend and not the other way around. Relatives and neighbors testified that Gamut had been abusive before. March 5th, 2014. The jury finally reached their verdict. They concluded that they simply couldn't buy Gamut's story and convicted her of first-degree murder. At her sentencing, Judge John McBain saw Gamut roll her eyes and snicker while Marcel Hill's aunt was reading an emotional letter. The sight infuriated the judge, who, when speaking directly to Gamut, said, You were relentless, you stab, you stab, you stab, you stab, you stab until he was dead. The judge gave Kami a gamut life in prison without the possibility of parole. I hope you die in prison as well. You know, if this was a death penalty state, you'd be getting the chair. Number 2. Eileen Wernos January 31st, 1992. Eileen was sentenced to death by the electric chair for murdering seven men, making her one of the most prolific female serial killers. She didn't cry or wail. Instead, she thanked the judge and said, Thank you. And uh, probably see, uh, I'll be up in heaven while y'all rotting in hell. Eileen Wernos had a troubled childhood. Her father was a convicted sex offender who took his own life in prison after her mother already abandoned her, leaving Eileen in the care of her paternal grandparents. At 15, Eileen found herself alone and forced to survive in the woods outside of Troy, Michigan, after a domestic incident with her grandfather. During this time, she would turn to prostitution and petty theft to make ends meet. 
From then on, we see her life go downhill. She would be arrested multiple times for DUI, robbery, and assault. But everything changed for her when she crossed paths with Tyra Moore, a hotel maid who would eventually become her lover. It was at this point that Eileen went on her killing spree. Now Eileen had conflicting stories about her murders. Sometimes she claimed that she was assaulted by each of the men she killed, while other times she had admitted to robbing them. Her first victim, Richard Mallory, was actually a convicted sexual predator. Eileen shot him multiple times and dumped his body in the woods. She would also head on to murder six more before her luck ran out. She was apprehended on a warrant after a brawl in a biker bar in Florida. Tyra was arrested the very next day and wasted no time turning on Eileen. Immediately after her arrest, Tyra made a series of phone calls to Eileen, during which Eileen confessed to all of her heinous crimes. January 16, 1992. Eileen Wernos went on trial, was convicted just two weeks later, and was sentenced to death. The wheels of justice turned pretty slow in American capital cases, and Eileen spent 10 years on death row. In 2001, she directly petitioned the court, urging them to expedite her sentence. She claimed that she was subjected to abusive and inhumane living conditions, and believed that she was being targeted by a sonic weapon. June 6, 2002. Eileen Wernos finally got her wish. And number one, Jody Arias. June 4, 2008. Jody Arias killed her boyfriend, Travis Alexander. She stabbed him, slit his throat, and shot him in the head in his home in Arizona. Now, this case quickly captured the attention of the media, as many believe she was a pure evil psychopath. In fact, she even earned the title of the most hated woman in America. Now, in 2006, Arias and Alexander crossed paths by chance, and their love story began. However, this blissful romance was short-lived. It didn't take long for Arias to raise concerns among Alexander's friends, who noticed her unhealthy obsession with him. She even went as far as to converting to Mormonism to please him. Alexander's friends later revealed that Arias invaded his privacy by snooping through his emails, eavesdropping on his conversations, and even following him to the bathroom waiting outside the door until he walked out. When Alexander decided to end that relationship, her obsession only grew stronger. They continued to stay in touch, and Arias would occasionally show up uninvited at Alexander's house. She became furious when she discovered that Alexander had moved on and started dating other women. Reports even claimed that Arias harassed these women and sought revenge by slashing his car's tires. Undeterred, Alexander made plans to attend a company retreat with a new love interest. However, as that trip approached, his friends tried to reach out to him but received no response. Little did they know, Arias had already taken his life. From the beginning, investigators believed Arias had killed Alexander. In addition to the bloody handprint and the damning photographs, they also found out that Alexander had been shot with a 25 caliber gun. It just so happened that the same kind of gun had been stolen from Arias' grandparents' house just a week before his death. 2013, charged with first-degree murder and facing the death penalty, Jody Arias would tell a different story during the trial. She said that Alexander became enraged when she dropped the camera while taking pictures of him in the shower. Arias admitted that she had killed him, but in self-defense. Jody further claimed that Alexander had long been abusive towards her. However, her claims were met with disbelief from everyone, and she was labeled as a pathological liar. May 8, 2013, the jury found her guilty of first-degree murder. Signed before person. Is this your true verdict? So say you want it all? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the During her sentencing, Jody Arias said that she wanted the death penalty. It's my firm belief that death would bring me untold peace and freedom. That's my personal belief. If I died today, I would be free and I would be at peace. However, the judge wouldn't grant that wish, and she was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. Though she did express regret about Alexander's murder during that sentencing, it seems like she's since adjusted to her new life in prison. 2016, in a recorded call, Arius was heard saying, If this is what it's like to be hated, then keep hating. I've had so much love coming in my direction, I can't even respond to it now. <laughs> 